بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أسأل الله تبارك وتعالى أن يجعل نياتنا قالسة لوجه, الدي... uh, لوجه الكريم I welcome all of you to another session of our nightly uh, life stories that we've been having all this Black History Month and you know we've talked to people from all over the spectrum in life and today i wanted to bring one of our allies and good friends in atlantic city new jersey with master muhammad and the muslim community and the community in general and a good friend of mine's uh the mayor of atlantic city mayor marty small senior and I wanted to have a conversation about the mayor himself as an African-American man who ascended to the highest office uh, in Atlantic City as being the mayor and the you know, one who everything in the city relies on his direction and his vision for the city. And really he has an interesting story because he comes from the inner city and he worked his way up the ranks. This wasn't no overnight success. Uh, it was success, it was failures, it was happy moments, disappointed moments. And you know, one thing that I say about Mayor Small is that he's never forgot where he comes from. And just the fact that he's on, it wasn't no long notice. I called him this morning. I said, Mr. Mayor, I need you. <laughs> he's like, what do you need? I'm there. And that is a, a beautiful thing, and it's a uh, something that I greatly appreciate. So what I'm going to do is um, turn it over to the mayor uh, to give some opening remarks for, you know, five or ten minutes, as we usually do with all of our guests, introduce yourself to uh, our listening audience, and then we're going to go into a relaxed discussion as we do. Uh, come on in, Mr. Mayor. All right, well, uh, good evening, Imam Amin Muhammad. Um, good evening uh, to your listening audience and good evening to the good people from Masjid Muhammad that's out there watching. Um, I'm at Marty Small Senior. I was born in the great city of Atlantic City. I have a slogan. I'm Atlantic City born, I'm Atlantic City bred. And when I die, I'm gonna be Atlantic City dead. You know, I love this city. Um, born and raised here, proud product of the public school system. I grew up in one of the worst neighborhoods in Atlantic City, um, VAC, which was a rival. Though I grew up across the street, you know, I like to claim uh, VAC, but in seriousness, um, I grew up in a household with eight women, no man in the house. Um, my church and uh, Boys and Girls Club and, you know, playing uh, sports at the PAL uh, kept me safe. I went to Atlantic City High School, graduated. Um, from there, I went on to Stockton University. Uh, Stockton University. Um, I was a former athlete. I'm a two-time athletic Hall of Famer, um, all-time leading rebounder, number 11 all-time leading scorer. And my team got inducted um, in 2018 when I was personally inducted in 2016. But more importantly, um, I graduated um, with a degree in communications. Um, I had adversity in college. Uh, my mom died uh, my sophomore year. I had aspirations uh, to play basketball overseas, but I promised that before I did anything that I would um, get my degree and, you know, make my mom proud. And that's what I did. Six days after I graduated, I signed the semi-professional basketball contract with the hometown Atlantic City Seagulls of the United States Basketball League. We won the championship uh, that year. Realizing that basketball wasn't going to pave the way, um, I started, um, I had relationships at home, uh, with the mayor, Mayor Whelan, who was my political mentor. And he always said, go to school, get, get good grades, come back home and get a job. And, you know, realizing that basketball wasn't going to pay the bills. I got my start in the city of Atlantic city in the welfare department. I was a social caseworker. Um, about, um, seven months later, um, I was tapped to run the city's program. It was a pilot program with Atlantic city, Bayonne, uh, New Brunswick, Newark, and a few other cities. It was a community police partnership grant, and I was the safe haven program coordinator. And my job at the time, the data showed that the 
neighborhood between New Jersey and Tennessee Avenue uh, was the worst in the city. And my job as safe haven program coordinator was to put on youth and senior activities in that neighborhood, quality of life. Um, I ran an all girls summer camp called Precious Jewels, all boys summer camp called All Sports. And, you know, we did a lot of exciting things. It was a uh, tried partnership with the New Jersey Department of Law and Public Safety, the Atlantic City Health and Human Services Department, and of course, the Atlantic City Police Department. Um, as I said earlier, I was a Boys and Girls Club kid, and every every person that um, was in a supervisory position would always say, well, one day when you come back, you're going to run the Boys and Girls Club, so forth and so on. And I had an opportunity to come home. And a lot of people say a lot of things about politicians, but this is what I respected about Jim Wellman. Um, while I was working as a safe haven program coordinator, I interviewed to run the Boys and Girls Club. And when I um, interviewed, it was a chance like to come back home. So they offered me the position. It was about $5,000 more than I was making. And I went to him. I said, I'm kind of torn. I want to go back home, but I do love what I'm doing for the city. He said, well, look, as the mayor, um, of course, I would want you to stay working for the city because what you're doing with the youth and seniors, it makes me look good. He said, but as a friend of Marty Small, someone who knows that he has political aspirations, if you stay with the city, you could never run for council. And, you know, you got to take that job. So I left there, went to the Boys and Girls Club. And in between that time, I was very active in the community, which um, that's when I first met your brother. Um, I started the Bank of America, Elwood Roberts, uh, Basketball League of Atlantic City. We ran that for eight years. That's when I first met Ray Ray. And shortly after that, you know, I met you. Um, I also was active. I was appointed to the Atlantic City Free Public Library Board of Trustees um, by Jim Whelan. Then I got the political itch to run for office. I ran for the Atlantic City Board of Education, was the top vote getter. Um, at the reorganization meeting right away, they voted me in as vice president. That's a term that I served for two years and then I ran for city council. And on January 1st, 2004, I was sworn in as the youngest elected councilman uh, in the history of Atlantic City. Um, from Boys and Girls Club, I went to run the Atlantic City Schools um, after school sports and clubs program. I was a coordinator of elementary extracurricular activities for 11 years. Um, then I ascended to city council president uh, in 2016. Uh, that's the year I also graduated with your wife uh, with a master's degree in educational leadership uh, from Cheney University since we're speaking about uh, Black History Month. So I do have a master's um, in, in educational leadership. Um, and listen, I just love Atlantic City. I'm married uh, to Dr. LaCorda Small, who's the principal of Atlantic City High School. We have a daughter, Jada, she's 13, and Marty Jr. is 10, he'll be 11 uh, on March 8th. And you know, I became the council president and from the council president, um, I ascended to the mayor seat um, last year in the election for the one year term. I got 70 percent of the vote in the prime, no, 65 percent of the vote in the primary, over 70 percent of the vote in the general. And I am up for reelection and we're going to continue to encourage people to dream big and vote small this June to let me serve the full four years um, to show what I'm fully capable of. The city's heading in the right direction. It's not perfect. Um, and we never promised that, but we did promise that our effort will be perfect. And like you said, I'm one that have never forgotten where I came from. And I'm just here to have this conversation with you. That's a little bit about Marty Small Sr. Let me ask you something. And this is serious because a lot of times when we, we talk, uh, and one thing I love about this city is that we have these opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times, and some even in some cities, People have elected officials that they don't know, they don't have any connection, where you can't I identify with them. What is it in your life that made you uh, pursue the educational choices and the career choice, in which happened to be in politics? What was it that made you want to go that route in life, where you had, you know, you? I, I know why you couldn't finish playing basketball. We're going to talk about that later. <laughs> But uh, um, we can we can get listen. We can get into my basketball game too, because I know there's a couple <laughs> people out there that's watching. And one, your brother said one, Rich Marcucci. And uh, all I'm gonna say is this: everybody that know, even now, 
I'm still a walking, talking double double, but that's a conversation for later. What made you take that path? What What is it? If you say, I look at my life, and what was the thing that inspired you to take the path in life you took? I mean, listen, I was hungry for success. Um, in the neighborhoods that we grew up in, uh, we're not supposed to make it, particularly, um, you know, growing up in a house with eight women. In the neighborhood, you grew up in Pitney. I grew up around uh, VAC. That's like back Maryland and Stanley Homes of today. Um, we're not supposed to make it. I mean, I was just driven by success, um, you know, by the grace of God. Um, I was able to overcome a lot of obstacles uh, in my life. We can get into that too later if you want to. But I've always been a leader amongst my peer group. And people would always say like one day, like even when I was little, one day you're going to be the mayor of Atlantic City. One day you're going to run the Boys and Girls Club. And those two things uh, came true. I was very politically active. Um, I used to hand out flyers for Second Ward Councilwoman Rosalind Norrell Nance. Um, I always worked and supported um, Jim Whalen's campaign. I was just always out there driven and, and like a sponge, always wanting to learn. And, you know, like I said, by the grace of God, I'm literally living the dream, man. Like, this is what I wanted to do. Um, I don't feel like it's work. Um, I surround myself with a tremendous staff. Um, shout out to all my staff that is that is watching right now. Um, there's not one day that in that mayor's office that I had to say, oh, okay, what do you do when this happens? Um, because I believe my life experiences have prepared me for that moment. And educationally, um, uh, my mom's funeral was July 14th, 1995 at Venice Park Church. And I leaned over in that casket. I said, I promise I won't do anything with basketball, anything else until I graduate. And knowing that the priorities, one day, I tell everybody, one day, you know, your, your skills are going to deteriorate. One of the things I always told kids, use basketball. Don't let basketball use you. Get something out of it because one day it's going to be over and you got to come into the real world. So um, thank God that I was able to have that experience and, you know, go to school for free and, you know, do the things and, you know, live the college life. I met my wife in college and just had my priorities in order. And I remember my, my first resume was my sophomore year in college. And anyone that knows me know that I'm a big sports fan Particularly, I'm a four for four guy. That that means Flyers, Phillies, Sixers, and Eagles. I'm I'm a crazy Eagles fan, and I always wanted to work in the sports field. I remember the late great Stuart Scott um, from ESPN uh, took me under his wing. I was always ambitious, wanting to learn. Like I wrote him a letter, told him who I was, and I wanted to be like him, etc. And I remember my mom playing a voicemail uh, from him, saying, "Send me his resume, etc." So um, I then became close with. Neil Hartman, the lead anchor at Comcast Sportsnet. So my resume said that I wanted to um, work. I wanted to be a sportscaster and I wanted to work in a major media market. And at the time, the uh, city of Philadelphia is the number four media market in the nation. And I interned at Comcast while I was playing for the Atlantic City Seagulls. I was renting uh, pathfinders from just four wheels, you know, with my you know, money that I made playing basketball um, at night to go intern at Comcast Sportsnet, which is located in the Wells Fargo Center. So it was a sacrifice on my part. And a position came up and no one could have told me that I wasn't going to get that job. And for this particular interview, my EOF counselor um, and one of the best men in my wedding, Tony Bethel, took me to the interview. And I remember on the way home, I'm like, oh, I got this. Like I knocked them out but they gave it to someone that was interning six months um, longer than me. But I always had a backup plan. And people that know me always say, I got a plan and a vision. So my, my resume, my sophomore year in college said, if not working as a sportscaster, I wanna come home and make a difference in the lives of youth in Atlantic City, particularly the Boys and Girls Club. And that's what I did. And that's how I became Mr. Marty. Um, and all my boys and girls club kids out there, we still share that same relationship today because I've never changed who I was and I won't.
one of the things, you know, uh, uh, when you were in your position in the at the Board of Education, and a lot of people don't know that me and you worked hand in hand in all of those sports with the uniforms, and uh, they just see me as Imam Amin now, and they forget that I was doing other things too. A and AC, AC 609 fashion. That's right, that's right. We got to revive. Don't forget that. <laughs> it's coming again. But you had a tremendous vision. Uh, and I remember when I was in school, and I don't know when you were in school, did y'all still have intramural sports? It was like two games. You know, I went, I went to New Jersey. That's the school of hard knocks, for the record. You probably went to Brighton or Indiana somewhere. All you got to do is ask your elders. I used to come from Brighton and run through New Jersey, uptown, all the ask the ask the people. Ask Brighton, the people. Brighton, Brighton would have been scared to suit up against our squad. I know they so was had a bunch of white guys, but they had one all-star black boy with a left hand that just was smoking people. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. But a uh, question, right? What gave you? I mean, because when we was coming up, we had that. Then it went away. What gave you the passion to expand it? Because you took that league and, and in different sports and expo ex uh, 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 exposed our children to many different forms of athletic that many people would have never imagined. Even when we had sports uh, in elementary and junior high level, it wasn't to the level that you took it. What was it that made you or inspired you to really get involved with the youth and take it to that level where you could have just done a job and that would have been it, but take it to the big level where they had the bulwark hall and they had uniforms. And I know firsthand because AC 609 benefited greatly from these great, great ideas of yours. What made you be passionate about that? Well, um, that's just who I am. Um, anyone that knows me know that I always say that the youth and singers are our two most precious resources and I treat them as such. And we can get into a little bit of my agenda about the city, but uh, back then I um, came from the Boys and Girls Club to the school system and had a chance to affect the entire city. The Boys and Girls Club, you know, was more neighborhood based. Um, we did a phenomenal job there, gave those kids experiences of a lifetime. Um, you know, always traveling, took them on the road, Camden, Trenton, Bronx, Queens, you know, Connecticut, Syracuse, New York. We were always on the road a lot to the point where the kids was like, well, Mr. Marty, can we play a home game? But I've always been passionate and I've always been competitive, you know, with myself. I always want to, you know, take things to the next level. And a lot of people, you know, uh, some of my detractors would say that it's overkill or that I'm doing too much or I'm spending too much money, um, you know, for kids. I mean, that statement doesn't sound right. You got to invest in the children and give them experiences. And the district hasn't had a program like that since I left. So one of the things I wanted to do is, is I wanted to break it down and not have just traditional sports. And you can give a kid a T-shirt. You can give a kid, you can give... Um, you know, the, the cheerleaders, which I made cheerleading a sport, you know, for, uh, for the schools. We could have gave them T-shirts and said, throw on some leggings. Uh, this is your uniform. Um, but I also wanted to support a local minority business. And that's when I came to you. And I remember um, your brother Ray Ray um, said he had stopped past MLK or something. And he, he made a comment, said, where, where are these kids from? Um, what city they from? And somebody said, no, this is Atlantic City. This is like Marty's program. And he called me that night and was just like, yo, man, I seen those uniforms and so forth and so on. So that's, you know, kudos to you. But we wanted to diversify the typical offerings that um, kids in the inner city are used to. We're talking about basketball. You heard Biggie in his lyrics. You you know, you even slinging, you got a you slinging crack rock or you got a wicked jump shot. So it wasn't just basketball, football. And I said, those little girls that cheer for the Dolphins, what are they going to be doing after school in the winter? And I came up with that concept, Super Saturday. And we started out at the high school. Um, we went to Bulwark Hall. We had it at Stockton University. And then eventually back to the high school where 
our crowds rivaled the battle by the bay because of the cheerleading. So like, instead of the typical sports, like we did uh, co-ed cross country, co-ed kickball, you know, field hockey, we did wrestling, of course, basketball, cheerleading, indoor hockey, but it wasn't just like indoor hockey. You had the equipment, you had the goalie mask, you know, they had, you know, jerseys. We did boys soccer, girls soccer, volleyball, um, you know, you know, sports like that. So in addition to that, it was more than sports because every child is not athletically um, equipped. So we did like photography, the arts, you know, uh, fashion, you know, different things like that. So um, that was my passion to do things on a level that hasn't been done and, you know, compete with my inner self to make it better every day for the children. I, I want to move to something because you, when you talk about your life and a lot of times I like to really have each other really talk about their lives because when we talk so that a person, because our youth, a lot of times they need something to aspire to. They need role models. They need examples because oftentimes we see negative pictures and we don't highlight the positive. You know, yeah. sometimes we have this concept of hating on one another. But you mentioned growing up in a home without, uh, with all women and not having men in your life. So how did that, that uh, gr growing up in that type of life transfer to you being a husband and a father to your children? And how important do you find that and from your own uh, experience and what you learned from being a father and being a husband and raising a strong, successful black family? How as an inspiration do you think that is for our youth? And, and how do you feel about that? Well, um, I had men, you know, in my life and they were like my coaches, the Boys and Girls Club directors. And I don't want to forget anybody. I'm talking about the Wilbur Banks, the Barry Hicks, uh, the coach Michael Bailey's of the world, the Kevin Brooks. Um, if I forgot anyone, uh, charge it to my head, not my heart. But I want to make a way um, for my family to have a better life than I had, to have better opportunities than I had. My wife and I are proud products of public schools. She's from North. Um, you know, of course, I'm from Atlantic City and we're, we're believers in public schools. Um, our kids go to public schools. Um, they don't go to private schools, anything like that. Um, speaking of that, like, I want to be an example because I didn't have a father in my life. Um, that's my best trait. Um, I'm Marty Smart Jr. and Jada's dad before I'm anything. And that's how I govern in the office. If it's an issue with family, it's always family first. You know, you have, because at the end of the day, when the title's mayor is gone, it's not like I'm the mayor and you know, we only connected because of the family situation. You know, it's, 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 it's one of those things where they're going to always be here. And to have, you know, a family, a boy and a girl with, with two parents in the house and, you know, they got tough shoes to fill, but you know, we don't make it easy for them. The kids earn everything they got. It's easy to say, well, my dad's the mayor and my mom's the principal of the high school. No, you're going to have to make your own way. Um, and we laying that foundation now um, and, and just giving them the education. Obviously, you know, with my wife having a doctorate and me having a master's, um, education is at the forefront. And that's first and foremost. And, you know, we divide the responsibilities of the house. I like to say I'm the director of entertainment and my wife is the director of education. But um, and because there's a pandemic and it's remote learning, there's not a better teacher that they can have. So family is extremely important. And just like I said, back to um, where never forgetting where you come from, because those degrees that I have are a piece of paper. It don't make me better than the next person that doesn't have, have a degree. But, you know, you just apply it more and you're more marketable. There's certain jobs that you can get because of your education level. And to show how important being in a neighborhood was um, as councilman, I'm going back. Um, you have to live in your ward. As the mayor, you can live anywhere in the city that you want. So there wasn't a lot of attractive areas in the second ward. And I had a vision for where I live now. A lot of people said, man, what are you putting that house in the alley for? What is he doing that for? But 
I knew that eventually that the neighborhood, you know, would build up. And today there's a school across the street. Um, I'm surrounded uh, by houses, but it was important to me once again, to never forget where I've come from. So my entire life, um, I lived pretty much in a triangle. I started out at 232 North Virginia Avenue across from VAC. Um, when Trump came through, wanted to be beautify, he took all of those homes, CRDA. So they took our house, but then they put us in another house. Um, and the only time that I lived outside of this area was for about a year when I lived directly across from MLK at 1126 Indiana Avenue while they were building a new house. And then, you know, I got married and during the time we planned, we went to an architect and built a custom home um, in the house that I live in now, but it's like a triangle. So um, it's important that, um, you know, children see that someone that grew up in the same environment that you are, someone who is down to earth, someone that nothing was ever given to them um, like I said, there's been adversity in my life that I had to overcome. And my life quote is by the late, great Dr. Martin Luther King. And it goes, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands at moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. So I'm going to continue to be an example of what's possible. Let's move to uh, as your position as the mayor. Uh, what is your yeah. vision for the city of Atlantic City? And when you look at previous administrations and, you know, you look at the development of the city and especially in this pandemic and the ec economic downturn that the country has suffered, the loss of jobs, the loss of revenue and business. And you're now in a position to, you know, revive Atlantic City. Uh, what is your vision for the city? Well, um, I'm going to tell the good people out there because I'm not going to, you know, give a two hour speech like I did last Thursday this time. Um, in my state of the city address, if you want to check it out, go to www.cityofatlanticcity.org. Scroll down some and it's on the home page. But I'm going to just talk about my 2021 vision. Um, first and foremost, um, my, my, my title for 2021 is Vengeance is Mine. And it's not meaning vengeance is mine from... Mayor Marty Small, but vengeance is mine, said Atlantic City. Um, COVID has decimated, uh, you know, our industry. Um, it's left a lot of people jobless, homeless. Um, you know, now more than ever, people are defending, depending on the various services for food. And we want to get a grip on COVID. And it's important that we don't get so distracted by the, vac the vaccine and forget about testing and become loose um, because it's important that we still test. Um, as of the 10th, which was the day before my State of the City address, um, the great city of Atlantic City um, had 2,555 cases of COVID overall and 58 deaths. And that's 2,555 and 58 deaths too many. But I'll take our response over any major city uh, in the country. We're an international tourist destination. And that's because we were prepared and we had a plan. I was the only one to come out to ask the federal government to put a site on Beta Field. That didn't happen. We asked the state to do it. That didn't happen. We asked the county. I had an hour and 13 minute conversation with Senator Cory Booker and let him know how um, Atlantic City has a large senior population, um, has a lot of people at poverty, and that we needed to do something. And I'm proud to say that the great city of Atlantic City and COVID funding round one was the only municipality in Atlantic County to receive CARES Act funds. We got $786,810. And what did we do? We put our money where our mouth was. We got two testing sites, one walk up at Showboat, one at Betafield for five months. We fed 3,780 senior citizens from uh, low income and disabled backgrounds 3,780 senior citizens, two hot meals per week. We did some virtual recreation in a partnership uh, with the uh, Atlantic City Board of Education. And we kept applying for more funds and we got $1.9 million, um, you know, to do other things COVID related for the city. So, but big picture in 2021, and I can go through it with a breeze. Um, I think we need to rebuild the Atlantic City boardwalk. It's in disrepair. 
except for the new section that the Army Corps built. Um, we can't depend on casino gaming any longer. We're going to always be a casino town, but we need to pivot. We need to talk about new industries, new incentives. I'm working with the state EDA, the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, the city of Atlantic City, um, the mayor's office for the first time has a small business academy that starts on March 24th. Um, kudos to my constituent director, uh, Bruce Weeks, who is running that program. It is from six to eight um, every Wednesday night. It's a nine week curriculum. Um, today, um, I had a press conference um, with um, Newark Mayor Roz Baraka and um, other urban mayors where we announced a um, hundred million dollar fan fund and that's 40 acres in the mule. And that is designed to um, get participating urban cities and in the great city of Atlantic City is a participant to give funds for African-American and uh, Latino businesses um, as we go along. And we'll roll it out on the cities in uh, next week. Um, we're going to continue our working relationship with the state. Um, we need to stop this two city uh, thing. Before we created, it was us versus them, but that's not the mentality with the board now or with the executive director, uh, Matt Darty, um, who has been very receptive uh, to our agenda. Just like we have cameras on the boardwalk, just like we're gonna eventually put them on Pacific and Atlantic, we need to cross over a few blocks more and, and let the whole city be under surveillance. We have marijuana coming. We have to create opportunities uh, for minorities. Um, what does that look like? Um, personally, um, I'm against marijuana. Um, I never smoked it, but at the end of the day, it's not about my beliefs. It's about the greater good for the good people of Atlantic City. And if it yields a revenue stream that's much needed for my taxpayers, you know, we're going to embrace it. Um, we want to make Pacific and Atlantic Avenue um, look a lot better. We want to increase family entertainment. Um, in about two weeks, I'm about to make another major announcement about family entertainment in addition to the water park and um, the 18 whole state of the art uh, miniature golf course. When you talk about urban urban entertainment, um, I did events for over 15 years. Marty Small Entertainment. We don't throw parties, we throw events. But that's something that the city doesn't do well. We do all other forms of entertainment. And when you look at all the urban centers near and far, that's within a three and a half hour drive to the great city of Atlantic City. We need to learn to value the black dollar more, and that's something that we don't do enough. Um, this, um, we're going to educate our community. Um, I talked about the Small Business Academy. We're going to um, teach people financial literacy where we teach our community how to invest. And we already have the framework. That's a part of our approved agenda. We have the framework where um, there's a young lady in particular um, out of Philadelphia that has a tremendous uh, program. I'm not going to say her name, but we want to bring her uh, to Atlantic City where we start with the kids and we have a financial literacy summer camp. We have financial literacy um, in all the after school programs. But what I'm excited about in our communities where the child will peer with the parents in the household and you teach the household how to invest. The other entrepreneurial opportunity that we're looking to do is have a trucking school here on Beta Field uh, by the summer. Um, we we are accepting proposals now. Um, you know, a couple of young Atlantic City men um, who are in that field or interested in coming back home and doing something like that. And listen, the quality of life uh, has to change. Um, everything is not perfect. Um, we have drug problems and, and a homeless problem, but it's not Atlantic City's homeless. It's municipalities near and far that are dropping their homeless population off in Atlantic City and saying. We'll go to Atlantic City and figure it out. We're going to continue to change the climate and culture in City Hall and show these employees uh, that we do care. And I'm just excited at this time. We got a bunch of projects um, that we're going to announce, um, such as the brand new um, Venice Park Bridge that's going to go into construction um, in the next couple months. We even secured a million dollars for the second bridge, which is in design phase. And streets like New York Avenue will be completely paved this spring. So that's just a little bit of what we're doing in addition to um, my quality of life agenda. We talked about recreation. Now we also have um, the Department of Senior Services where we're going to do things with the seniors. Um, like when we have programs uh, with the seniors, 
and they talk about um, we're going to bring the senior programs to the seniors. Um, it's COVID. So we're going to socially distance and we're going to get in all those senior buildings. We're going to have games. We're going to take them to shows. And we got a revamp health department. I said I was bringing the health department back. It's happening, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to give them uh, health services, water aerobics. Um, we are in touch with the New Jersey um, Touch Food Alliance from Camden, which um, we're working with them for a monthly food giveaway that is needed. It will go to weekly. And one of the things I'm excited about is a 55 plus job training program where qualified seniors can work for nonprofits. Nonprofits get a free qualified senior over the age of 55, but the state of New Jersey pays them between 12 and $16 an hour. I'm bringing the multicultural office back, um, you know, to promote, um, you know, our growing uh, multicultural community. And it's not just going to be one person. The city had the multicultural office before it was one one person in there. We're going to have a staff of, of about five for from various backgrounds. Um, we're going to have a consulate day for each nationality. I think the first one is with the Bangladeshi community on um, April 10th. Kudos to Mimi Nambo, and we're partnering uh, with Ocean Inc. Um, to get that done. Um, we also going to have um, the anti-violence program, which is called One Neighborhood Evolution, which is a program uh, that I wrote uh, two years ago. And uh, one of your good friends is hired, and he started on Tuesday. Um, kudos to um, o Omar. Um, he's our program coordinator. Um, couldn't be more excited. Um, to have him on board um, under the leadership of the um, director, Floyd Talley. Um, um, others, we have Craig Newsom on board. And, you know, we had a couple of people um, that we're talking to now and to get on board. But that's that's a game changer because all the time people would always say, what are we going to do about violence? What are we going to do about this? My administration is going to take that proactive approach for the first time ever. The city has its own program and they're going to be held accountable. And I want to read you a quote from uh, Cure Violence. It says the key to following a successful collaboration of anti-violence programs are the stakeholders, elected officials of all levels. The Lieutenant governor is on board. The chief of police is on board. Public health department. That falls under the direction of Dr. Wilson Washington, who is our health and human services uh, leaders. The business community, the casinos on board, the hospitals, the faith leaders, so forth. The media, the press of Atlantic City wrote an editorial how how different that we're doing things um, when it comes to violence. So that's just a little bit of my platform. And speaking of violence, the Stop the Violence League, uh, the Stay Hungry in Venice Park, they've outgrown that. And um, kudos to my business administrator because we had a conversation and um, he brought up Beta Phil and then my will start spinning in the visionary. So we're going to build them a court on beta field. And it's going to be sort of like the field of dreams. If you build it, they'll come. So we're going to have a lot of fun with that promotion. Beta field, 148, excuse me, 141 unobstructed acres. With that basketball thing, it's going to open up vending opportunities for everyone. So this is the type of leadership that we're bringing um, for little girls. Um, we're working with the Atlantic City Boxing Hall of Fame um, and Jackie Atkins to bring girls in gloves here to the great city of Atlantic City. It's so much, but we don't have enough time to do that. I'll just take your question. Right, yeah, yeah. go. I'm excited. I'm excited. Hey, hey, hey I got to tell you, uh, uh, Mayor Small, that, you know, you know, over the years, me and you have had a relationship of pounding each other. Right. Uh, but you're doing an excellent job as my books. Excellent, small, excellent, right? And I, 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 we're happy for you, really. Uh, you know, to to see all that you've been through. One thing, and 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 we can talk about that maybe at another time because we are. I want to get the you know the attendees to their questions, but I watch you go through a lot of struggles. And you know, and through even through when they were trying to end your whole career, with my life, yeah. yeah, your whole life, and you know those those difficult moments, and you stay focused. And 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 
I remember you used to say to me all the time, it's, it's my turn, it's my turn. And I would say, your turn is coming, you went to your turn. Now you got your turn and you're, you're making the most of it. And, and you know, I, I, I really uh, am happy for your success, you know? And, and, and all we can do from our side to assist you, to support you, to encourage you, you know, you know we're going to do that. Uh, but here, related to what you're talking about, uh, Sister Malika Muhammad said, what about opportunities for inmates coming home and monitoring harsh parole officers? And that program you have is interesting because the people you have have had these uh, experiences. So maybe you can talk about that. Um, that's, that's the only way that it's going to work. Um, and that's where you see successful programs uh, throughout the country. Um, we're not just local. Like I said today, um, you saw our statewide reach where I believe we may be one of the only municipalities in South Jersey that's participating in that $100 million plan fund. But our reach extends across the country because as soon as the pandemic is over, um, that program is going to Los Angeles at no cost to the taxpayers. They're going to provide us free training. And they said they wanted us to come out there and spend a few days and go through the different neighborhoods and meet with the Bloods and the Crips and show how um, they're doing things in Los Angeles. And they're going to provide virtual training um, in the next couple of weeks. But as I stated, that's not my entire agenda, but I could speak on this. Um, we can't control uh, the parole officers. That's, that's above my pay grade. But what the city is going to have as well, and we've already worked with who is considered the guru and the czar of reentry in the state of New Jersey is former governor Jim McGreevy. Um, and we're working with volunteers of America. The city, separate and apart, but working with, we are going to have someone that is going to be our reentry coordinator that is going to mainstream these, mainstream these people back to society. And one of the things that we talked about, we're not just listening to jail talk. And respectfully, you know what that means. You get a phone call from the homie. You know, he's behind bars. Man, I'm done. I'm telling you, I'm coming home. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. We got to provide meaningful opportunities to reduce the recidivism rate because once that person comes home, tries and tries and tries, and there's no opportunities, guess what? He's going to have to do what he has to do with it for his family. But where the small administration is going to come in at, we're going to have a coordinator that's going to, and we got counselors that we're about to hire as well, that's going to have a case where you come home, we're not putting you in a job. We're not giving you um, an excuse to fail. We're going to have training and we're going to do it with ACCC where if you get a certificate and it shows that you went through six to eight weeks, you got to get buy-in from the job market because guess what? The jobs are going to come back. They're starting to come back. The season is approaching. So with that piece of paper that you get from our program, it's going to tell the world that you, A, you are fully rehabilitated and you are employable. And not only that, you have the ability to sustain employment. So that's what this administration is going to continue to do for the good people of Atlantic City. Uh, this is an important question. Uh, uh, Matisse is thinking outside the box, and I'm proud of him. Right, maybe those those post fudge reflections is helping the brother. Right, <laughs> that was tough. Uh, what about mental illness programs, especially in our community? That's a that's an issue that's overlooked and and not really paid a lot of attention to. What are you looking in terms of mental illness programs? Well, that's why we have um, the health department back in Atlantic City. We have a health officer. We have a director of health and human services who is who is about to hire uh, counselors. Uh, social workers, mental health. Um, our police department um, got a $700,000 grant from the Department of Justice that's going to partner with Jewish Family Services, and they're going to provide four counselors that's going to work with people that's dealing with mental illness. I know mental illness is important, and that's why I made that decision at the onset of the pandemic to keep our beach and boardwalk open. Because though the governor said, stay in the house, you know, in the next breath, he said, we encourage people to get out, ride a bike, take a job, exercise. There's no better better place to do that than the Atlantic City Boardwalk. And the residents uh, gave that rave reviews because everyone else around us closed.
But I mean, if you know me, I don't necessarily listen to what everybody else say. So I made an executive decision and we kept that boardwalk open and it was rehab for our residents, particularly our seniors, um, to get out the house because some people hasn't haven't left the house since last March and mm-hmm. it lays on your mental. So that's at the top of our agenda, um, dealing with the mental health in this community as well. Uh, what about the young adults from 22 to 35? You know, they're, and we're seeing the city is a lot of them coming up with business, coming up with ideas. What what ideas do you help you have to help those that young generation grow? Because you mentioned the trucking thing, but some of these got clothing companies. They got all kinds of stuff these young people are coming up with today. What well, are you going to do from your side and your administration to help them grow and prosper? Um, we are we are already doing it. Um, and thank you for the question. Um, I would ask you to contact Bruce Weeks by phone 609-347-5400. That's the mayor's office. Or you can email B or no, no, 609-347-5400. Okay. 5400. That's the mayor's office. And you ask for Bruce Weeks. Or you can email B Weeks, and that's B W E E. K E S B Weeks at City of Atlantic City dot org. And you can sign up for the Mayor's Office Small Business Academy that starts on March 24th. Mm-hmm. Uh, classes will be held six to eight. It's held virtually now. Um, they'll, they'll be held via Zoom, but we're going to have things like a competition night, a funding night. And we even in discussions with Tanger outlets the walk that the person with the best business plan, they get maybe six months free of rent for a startup and have one of the storefronts at the walk. But this is in partnership with Stockton University, LIADA, which is the Latin American Economic Development Association, um, SCORES, the African American Chamber of Commerce in New Jersey, the New Jersey um, Economic Development Authority and CRDA. And it's a nine week curriculum and it's a cohort, similar to what I said, me and your wife went through, it was seven of us that made sure every one of us graduated. I mean, the group text that was going on four and five in the morning because everybody was lazy or tied up during the week uh, with work. And we knew we had an assignment due at nine o'clock in the morning. We all pulled each other through. So this is what we want. It's not McDonald's or Burger King when you say, let me get a large fry. Let me get a nugget and a soda and you go. They're going to go together. It's a cohort. So you can't come the first week and then say, well, I want to come back week eight. So some of the things um, in the curriculum is like the seven steps to owning a small business, building a winning business plan, like the elevator pitch, the marketing, social media, the five C's of credit, so forth and so on. So if you have a business and you're serious about it, or you want to start a business, even if you're a current business owner that needs a refresher, the great city of Atlantic City coming from the mayor's office is providing this opportunity for you. And guess how much it costs? Zero. It's free. Take advantage of it. We're going to put things in place that have never been in place before for this community. Just take advantage of it. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, I guess we, we're there with the questions. Uh, we did good numbers. Question. Um, uh, I can't take a sip, right? Yeah, you can do whatever you want. Just, you know, this is, this is going to be the time where I'm going to just leave you alone and let you do your thing. <laughs> uh, That'll be a first. <laughs> um, now, I have a question. Serious. This is a serious question. And I want you to think about this because, oh, wait, wait, wait. I got one question before I go to that. Well, yeah, let me go to that. <laughs> Mentoring future youth in the political process and actually showing them how this process <clears throat> work for when you do your terms and may you have many to come to put all these initiatives and be successful. Uh, What about successive uh, 
generations to come and having the political know-how to navigate this process and prepare that the next generation will be in position to carry the torch or when you pass the baton. Because as you know, one of the big complaints, and it is one that I have really, that we didn't pass the baton well. We didn't prepare well succeeding generations to fill in these spots of leadership and you know what are you going to do in terms of that that's long-term thinking because we know you want like 10 or 20 more years right mm -hmm. and that's good but in the process well it's it's not what i'm gonna do it's what i'm doing um i know as a young guy i had to fight and kick the door down uh to get in um, I made a comment to um, Speedy Marsh at the State of the City address. And I remember when Speedy was the council president and, you know, I felt that I wanted my turn. And I'm like, look, you know, Speedy and Speedy was like, I'm going to do one more year. I'm going to do one more year. And then one night after the council meeting, we stayed for a long time and it was just me and him. And this, this is what really kind of woke me up. He said, look, to be a leader, you don't got to be the council president. You know, a leader leads by example and kind of gave me some pointers, some constructive criticism, a real heart to heart. And I took I, I took that. I said, you know, he's right. And I started doing things differently, um, getting more involved in the finance and, and, and of the city, um, you know, and all of that stuff. But it's, it's extremely important. And I said that I will not do the same thing that I criticize the people before me for doing, which is not providing opportunities for young people. Just look in the mayor's office. I got two younger people, my aide, Kashawn Cash McKinley, young guy, Bruce Weeks, director of constituent services. Look around City Hall now at who's getting opportunities. It's young people that's getting opportunities that other administrations wouldn't even have looked at their applications. Because I believe in second chances. Sometimes our people need a third and a fourth. So we're going to continue to provide that opportunity and we're going to replenish the bench. And it's not where you start. It's where you finish. Because when you look at me having an opportunity when I came home from school, and I thought because I was a local basketball star and I was collect, uh, connected to the mayor and other community leaders, and I have a degree, oh, I'm coming home making 50 grand, but I got a rude awakening. My, my first salary with a college degree was $19,500. So we're giving young people opportunity. We're going to continue to give them opportunity because like I said, I know the feeling that wanting to be a part of something and for whatever reason you can't. So we're going to continue to provide those opportunities because we need to constantly replenish the city's bench politically and the uh, staff at City Hall, and we're doing that in a big way. You're on mute. You're on mute. And, and some cities, and, and I remember this, it was, you know, it was something that I, I had the opportunity to do that I had as a minority business for years, as you know, the major contract for the Board of Education for what I did, and Y'all was really there supporting me. And, and, I, and I, I will never forget that. Yourself, uh, Mr. Joe Beeman, uh, and they were like pillars for ensuring that we had an opportunity to be successful. And, and you ensured that. What about uh, businesses now, you know, especially minority businesses that are up and running, are there means to, in, uh, open ways for them to get contracts with the city, with different aspects, netting with different companies, even if it's not with the city, but with other ventures, construction projects. Mm -hmm. give yeah. local businesses um, one, the opportunity. One, one of the things, not only uh, do we have that small business program, but um, in a couple of weeks, I'm gonna roll out um, the criteria, the city itself directly, the city is going to help um, small businesses with funding because everyone is struggling. That's in addition to all the other things that we're doing. Um, 
and I'm always looking for talent. Um, I stole Miss Mona Talley uh, from the county. Um, she's now in the city's affirmative action officer, and that's going to be her job to make sure that local and minorities um, participate on these job sites um, when this development boom happens, that um, they're getting contracts and, you know, we got the right person for that. So every step of the way, every problem, every problem, we have a solution and a plan uh, to get it done. So, you know, things aren't going to happen overnight, but we're headed in the right direction and I couldn't be more pleased. You're on mute. I'm sorry, I keep forgetting, breaking my own rules. What, what about long-term substance abuse treatment facilities? Uh, mm -hmm. what's on, I know we have the John Brooks things. I think that's offshore now, right? Yeah, yeah let's get ready to move out of the city. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we have the needle exchange. Um, and, and listen, at the end of the day, we all guys, children, and we have people in our families that, um, you know, have issues. And we're sensitive to that, but um, it's time for other municipalities near and far to pick up the social service baton. And that's why you see a lot of people on the corners, you see uh, needles at, you know, in certain places and so forth and so on. So um, we have no plans uh, to continue um, the substance, uh, you know, abuse facilities um, here in the city of Atlantic City. Okay. Um Face-based initiatives, right? Uh, what what about your efforts in that uh, area? What what type of programs do you have for those faith-based communities who have services they want to offer and their participation in the community? What type of networking are you doing with that? Well, uh, first and foremost, um, we've had a great relationship, uh, you know, with you as the Imam of Masjid Muhammad. We have uh, um, relationships uh, with the other imams in town. Um, we're very close with the Atlantic City Fellowship of Churches, the, excuse me, the Fellowship of Churches of Atlantic City uh, and vicinity. Um, and as a matter of fact, we, we're doing a program where I'm um, speaking about part of my um, vision is um, neighborhood and commercial development, where we gave 10 lots to the Fellowship of Churches uh, to build um, low income housing for Atlantic City residents. So all of those partnerships are about to be announced. Um, uh, you know, shout out um, to my uncle, Pastor Wong Young, um, and my pastor, um, Reverend Collins A. Days uh, Senior. So we're definitely grounded um, in the faith-based, um, you know, initiatives. Okay. Uh, so you, you hit the housing. And uh, uh, police and crime. Because we live in, uh, you know, a time that is, you know, very troubling with, uh, you know, we had the George Floyd and all these things. What is the city doing to ensure that there is, uh, you know, proper relationships between uh, the community, the residents and police and the, you know, lowering crime in Atlantic City? And one of the things that was on the tip of my tongue that I had forgot, and I'll get into that. Um, and all in addition to investing the small business, the entrepreneur with the trucking school, um, one of the things that the city is going to partner with um, uh, Ricardo Belgrave, Atlantic City native, and uh, Flama Ramor, and, and Keller Williams is we're going to provide opportunities for Atlantic City residents to get their real estate license. Um, it's a, like about a nine week course, his curriculum is encouraged to get more minorities into the real estate industry. Money's at an all time low. So people are making tons of money, but we want our people um, to experience that boom as well. But when you talk about um, the Atlantic City Police Department, it's programs like One Neighborhood Evolution that's going to come in and deal with the population that has issues uh, with violence to prevent it preventative measure, getting out in front, not reacting, my administration is going to be proactive. Um, we know that petty crimes are up during the pandemic, you know, for obvious reasons, but um, we have full faith in Chief Sarkos that, um, you know, he will continue to do a great job. Um, one of the things that people are not talking about enough 
according to the FBI and state police, when the city submitted that data, that um, major crimes is down 33%. Um, when you talk about substations, I want a substation back Maryland, uh, Carver Hall, you know, the village, Texas Avenue area, and the boardwalk. We want to cover the whole city for accountability because when I came in, I had a leadership theme, a leadership theme, and it was an acronym-based theme, and it's called Let's Ace It. And those are the elements that I want to govern by. And let stands for leadership, expectations, transparency, and stability. And A stands for accountability, credibility, and excellence and execution, because it makes us no good if we have all these robust plans and we can't succeed. And my leadership quote that defines the quote that defines my leadership style is from Simon Sinek, who's a British American author, motivational speaker, and organizational consultant. And it goes like this: it says, leadership is not about being in charge. It's about taking care of the people in your charge. And that's a responsibility that I take seriously. That's the residents, taxpayers, and businesses here in the great city of Atlantic City. And speaking of accountability, we're holding the police accountable. How many times that people uh, say that we never see cops ride down our street? We got a plan for that. And every cop car coming soon and very soon, there's going to be a tablet. And it's not a tablet so they can read the newspaper, be on social media tweeting. No, it's equipped with a GPS because at the end of every shift, it will be a printout to show what that officer was doing. And that's accountability. That's next level. In addition to that, we're upgrading our cameras to the Exxon Body 3 cameras. That's on the officers for better video, better audio, but more importantly, it gives us the ability to live stream. So, Imam Amin, if you are a sergeant and you are at Chelsea Heights, and there's an incident in another part of town. You can live stream into the officer that's dealing with the problem, and there's two-way communication. These are the things that we're doing in the police department and putting great people like you. Um, I appointed you to the Citizens Advisory Board, which is a board that works with police, that deals with issues in the community, and I couldn't think of a better person uh, to do that. We're going to put you on the mayor's office task force on violence to assist one neighborhood evolution and make sure that we all communicate um, frequently um, to be on the same page. So these are the things that the small administration is doing and I couldn't be more excited. There's one thing I gotta do before I get myself killed. Uh, 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 I have a beloved brother from uh, Florida and he had a question and, and he thinks I'm always hard on him. I am, but you know. <laughs> But this is a good question in terms of people who want to visit Atlantic City. It says, uh, Mayor Marty Small Sr., my family in Atlantic City, tell, tell me the beaches are nice there. When should I schedule the best time to visit with these new projects you have in mind? Also, I'm a sportsman. How's the recreational fishing in Atlantic City? Well, you just gave me a commercial, Farouk. There's no better place to be in the great city of Atlantic City. There's no better place to fish than our back bays. Uh-oh, you went out. Where you go? I knew don't ask for Ruth's question. <laughs> uh, let me see what happened. Uh, hold on, let me get the mayor. Uh-oh. Give him a second to reconnect. Going to give him a chance to uh, the mayor to check back in. We have a few minutes left. Uh, but maybe his internet uh, connection went, so we'll wait for him. 
Oh, here we go. All right, go ahead. You went out somehow. You got excited. I don't know what happened. Yeah, well, well, well. Look, I know where I left off at, but um, there's no better place to be. Um, we have a seawall. Um, we have um, the jetty, which is overlooking nothing but the ocean. There's no better place to fish. Um, any type of beach you want. We have what we call it affectionately the inkwell, um, which is the first beach where a lot of the African American community uh, frequent. So. With all of these projects and everything that we got going on, the time to be in Atlantic City is now. So come on down. Uh, uh, let me see if there's any more less questions. Uh, uh, okay, I think we're done. Uh, okay. Uh, let me see. Okay. So uh, with that, we, we've reached... Uh, we went over excellent job and 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 i hope that you know we will have frequent updates because you know there are many people that want to come to atlantic city there you know and we want definitely to know that you know it, it, it's always a great day in the city of atlantic city as you say and it's a great day <laughs> the city of atlantic city huh absolutely always a great day but one thing I'm honored to be in this city is that the, the family we have in Atlantic City, even though, you know, there's always troubles in every family and there's difficult, but we seem to always come together and get it done. And I think under your leadership as the mayor that we're going to have a bright future in the city. And, you know, you always, as will have us as a partner with you. Uh, I, you're doing amazing things. And, Is that an endorsement? Huh? Is that an endorsement? Always, <laughs> hey, you got it. We, we, we talk, you, it's there, right? My, my thing is, you're doing what we always talked about. You know, yeah. you are succeeding. And your success is not just your success, and you're showing that your success is our success. The city is coming up. People who would have normally never had a chance, and I know that firsthand from some of our own people who are now, their income is rising, they're in a better position, they're getting responsibility. People that would not have no hope are having hope, like you're talking about Beta Field, building that basketball court, uh, that's going to be something beautiful. And, and you know, there's so many things, and, and I know with you, as I've mm -hmm. always known, there's going to be more coming down. Uh, coming like down. Said, look, we, we we just getting started. Believe me. And 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 just remember, you always have a partner in Master Muhammad. You always have a partner with you know Imam Amin. You know we go we go back. We we've been doing things, and I I want to be a part of helping you be successful in your endeavors. And, you know, we, we keep you in our prayers and we hope that you and your family are successful and that uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects you from all harm and all difficulties and, 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 and clears your way, make easy for your way success. And, you know, Mayor, this is your home. You always, uh, you know, have an outlet to express and share your ideas with our listening audience and it's going to spread. And I ask all of you right now to press the share button because we need these to go around the city, I mean, around the country, so that other mayors can see like, you know, hey, what is happening in Atlantic City, this great city, and what can be done in their cities? And, and for us as Muslims, we could see that we could have these relationship with our leaders, and there is a way where we can work together and we can build a better society for all of us so this is something that we uh, we really appreciate, and you know, I look forward to um, the next four years of prosperity for our city. And you know, I'll let you close out with any closing words for the next five yeah, minutes, and, and we'll yeah. bring it to an end. Uh, number one, I would just like to thank you um, for giving me the opportunity. I'm humbled um, to your listening audience, viewing audience. Um, for indulging me this last hour plus. Um, listen, um, we got a plan. We got a vision. 
And, you know, we can do this together. I can't do it by myself. So there's an election uh, coming up on Tuesday, June 8th. It's for the full four-year term. And I would just say to the good people of Atlantic City, remember who has been here for you. Um, tough times don't last. Tough people do. Um, and, you know, I like to say a leader knows the way, shows the way, and goes the way. And we've been doing that. We spoke about our response to COVID. We spoke about our response uh, to the riots. Atlantic City is not Portland, Oregon for a reason. We had a few hours of bad behavior, but we bounced back like we always do. So just remember who was here for you. There's going to be certain people that come around and say they want your vote. Just remember who's always been there, who's going to continue to be there. And my administration is what all of your hopes and dreams are made of for the great city of Atlantic City. So remember, a small plan makes a big difference. And we're going to encourage each and every one of you to dream big, vote small. All I want is what every other mayor has had. And that's an opportunity for the full four-year term. Trust me, even if we disagreed politically or you don't support me because of what someone else said and you don't really know me, get to know me. Because if you get to know me, you know, my effort is always going to be perfect. I love this city. I wear it on my sleeve. And I would like to continue with the great progress that we've made so far. All right. And and and, and I thank you. I know this was a last minute. You know me. I get to see come that that's kind of the privilege though. I gotta take that just to know, like, you know, the hookup, you know. <laughs> I know you're busy. Look, man, I need you. And that to me means a lot, really. That we have that relationship that we never forget where we come from. That's beautiful. That to and me never will. That's the and and and, and I want to throw a shot at your brother Ray Ray. Uh, you know, Triple B basketball league. What was Pitney Village first? But but wait, I, I think excuse me. Pitney, New Jersey, and then you got Pitney Village, New Jersey. So I right, let's just make sure we know what we're talking about. Go ahead. Listen, <laughs> let me just say this. Um, I think he's still mad that. My good friend, Mike McFadden, a.k.a. Triple B, a.k.a. Bubba Bean Basketball, said that I was the greatest Triple B player of all time. He called me the Michael Jordan of Triple B. Now, let's go to the year before it was Triple B when it was Pitney League. When I came down there and I dominated um, Pitney's favorite big man, I ain't going to put him on blast, but I'm going to just say this. I scored 43 on a Friday against him. Then the next day I came back on a Saturday and dropped another 43. But more importantly, Ray Ray with the, uh, with, with your old money, I took five trophies and walked straight down Baltic Avenue with a six foot MVP trophy in my left arm and the other four in my right arm traffic stopping. Everybody saying, where you going? I'm bobbing and weaving. I'm like, I just won MVP. I'm taking the Pitney Village trophy and put it in the middle of VAC. Bang. <laughs> and I'm Mayor Marty Small Sr. And I approved this message. So that means you got two passes. You got a pass to come into Pitney and you got a pass to go into VAC. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Marty. We love you. We love you, Mr. Mayor. We love you. And we really, 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 really appreciate your leadership. And we're going to keep you in our prayers. Let us close out. We see us rod and fatty ups. And we look forward to having you again. Y'all have a good night. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you.